Hello and welcome to this first look exploring session, the second uh, session looking at Midas by John Lilly, our last John Lilly play for these first look exploring sessions. Uh, we are going today from Act 3, Scene 3, until we stop. We we might get to the end of the play, we don't know. We, we have scheduled a, a, a mini session to finish the play if we don't get to the end. Uh, I don't know how far we're going to get. Hopefully it, we're going to uh, certainly get into, into the uh, early stages of Act 5 and uh, get into the, the lower slopes of the play. If you want to know the story so far, basically he heard about Midas, he turns stuff he touches into gold. That, that's basically it so far. Um, various incidents have occurred along the way, some involving uh, comedy servants and uh, some involving obviously the, the, the fundamental problem of uh, uh, of Midas uh, and and uh, relations with his various advisors in court. Uh, various advisors have, uh, have been saying, you sh you, maybe you should do other things if you're offered great uh, wishes by a god. Maybe you should uh, you should choose uh, choose more wisely or different things. And some debating has been going on there. To continue our journey through the text, uh, we have this uh, wonderful team of readers. So reading today, uh, Petellus or Petulus, first nymph and uh, dry upon is hi there i'm emma kemp uh, i'm an actor and i'm in london uh reading uh Lichio, uh, midas and eristus today is hi i'm lynn i'm a college composition teacher i live in the northwestern united states uh reading um ruler uh second nymph and menalcus is hi i'm eric if i remember all that i mean I... Yeah, sometimes people get so many random parts, uh, especially uh, unhelpful the way I pronounce them. Uh, reading uh, Dello and Melocrites today is... I am Lois. I live in London. Uh, reading Camilla, Thalia and uh, Minucius. Hi, Alan Scott, based in Suffolk. Uh, reading Celia, Pan and a Huntsman is... Hello, I'm Helen Good and I'm in Hull. Uh, reading Suavia, Apollo, and Amintas is muted. Still muted, but saying beautiful things, I'm sure. <clears throat> Aliki Chapel, actor, theatrical translator, theatre maker, based in the Northwest and uh, UK. Uh, reading uh, Motto, Martius, and Third Nymph is. And also vexed in the northwest, Stephen Longstaff. Uh, reading uh, Sufferina, uh, Arato, and uh, Selfless today is Rachel, actor in New Jersey. And uh, being the personification of some reeds, uh, Corin, and uh, maybe some additional text later on is Brian e. Sparrow, actor in the East Midlands. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I'll be reading stage directions and generally keeping everything moving along. Without further ado, we're going to dive into Act 3, Scene 3. Uh, we have a whole uh, a series of people coming in, some we've met before, some we haven't. So we uh, see Sofri uh, uh, Sofrina, uh, Celia, uh, Camilla, I don't know if we've met Camilla before, Amarula, I don't think we've met before, and Suavia, I don't know if we've met before. We may have done, I may have just forgotten. These five people enter. Ladies, here must we attend the happy return of my father. But in the mean season, what pastime shall we use to pass the time? I will agree to any, so it be not to talk of love. Then sleep is the best exercise. Why, Suavia, are you so light that you must chat of love, or so heavy that you must need sleep? Penelope in the absence of her lord beguiled the days with spinning. Indeed, she spun a fair thread, if it were to make a string to the bow wherein she drew her wooers. Why, Suavia, it was a bow which she knew to be above thy strength, and therein she shrewed her wit. Quilatus arguerit, corneus arcus erat. It was made of horn, madame, and therein she showed her meaning. Why dost thou not think she was chaste? Yes, of all her wooers. To talk with thee is to lose time, not well to spend it. How say you and the ruler? What shall we do? Tell tales. What say you, Salia? Sing. 
What think you, Camilla? Dance. You see, Suavia, that there are other things to keep one from idleness besides love. Nay, that there is nothing to make idleness but love. Well, let me stand by and feed mine own thoughts with sweetness, whilst they fill your eyes and ears with songs and dancings. Amarula, begin thy tale. There dwelt sometimes in Phrygia a lady very fair, but passing forward as much marveled at for beauty as for peevishness misliked. High she was in the instep, but short in the heel, straight-laced but loose-bodied. It came to pass that a gentleman as young in wit, in wit as years, and in years a very boy, chanced to glance his eyes on her, and there, and there were they dazzled on her beauty as larks that are caught in the sun with the glittering of a glass. In her fair looks were his thoughts entangled like the birds of canary, of canary that uh, fall into a silken net. Don't he... Dote he did without measure, and die he must without her love. She, on the other side, as one that knew her good, began to look askance, yet felt the passions of love eating into her heart, though she dissembled them with her eyes. <laughs> Why laughst thou? To see yon madam so tame as to be brought to hear a tale of love that before were so wild you would not come to the name, and that... A Merula could devise how to spend the time with a tale, only that she might not talk of love and how to make love her only tale. Indeed, I was overshot in judgment, and she in discretion, Amarula, another tale or none. This is too lovely. Nay, let me hear any woman tell a tale of ten lines long without a ten to love. <laughs> I will be bound never to come at the court. And you, Camilla, that would fain trip on your petty toes, can you persuade me to take delight to dance and not love? Or you that cannot rule your feet can guide your affections, having one as unstayed as the other unsteady. Dancing is love sauce, therefore I dare be so saucy as if you love to dance, to say you dance for love. But Camilla, she would sing whose voice, if it should utter her thoughts, would make the heart tune of a heart out of tune. She that hath crotchets in her head hath also love conceits. I dare swear she harpeth not only on plain song, and before you, Sophronia, none of them all use plain dealing, but because they see you so curious, they frame themselves counterfeit. In myself, as I know honest love to be a thing inseparable from our sex, so do I think it most allowable in the court, unless we would have all our thoughts made of church work, and so carry a holy face and a hollow heart. Ladies, how like you Suavia in her loving vein? We are content at this time to soothe her in her vanity. She casts all her minds in the mould of her own head, yet erreth so as far from our meanings as she doth from her own modesty. Amerila, if you were not bitter, your name had been ill-bestowed. Well, I think it is as lawful in the court to be counted loving and chaste as you in the temple to seem religious and be spiteful. I marvel you will reply any more, Amerila. Her tongue is so nimble it will never lie still. The like are thy feet, Camilla, which were taught not to stand still. So, no more, ladies. Let our coming to sport not turn to spite. Love thou, Suavia, if thou think it sweet. Sing thou, Celia, for thine own content. Tell thou tales, and dance thou, Camilla. And so everyone using her own delight shall have no cause to be discontent. But here cometh Martius and the rest. And indeed, here enter Martius and Melocrites and possibly some others. What news, Martius, of my sovereign and father Midas? Adam, <clears throat> he no sooner bathed his limbs in the river, but it turned to a golden stream. The sands to fine gold and all to gold that was cast into the water. Midas, dismayed at the sudden alteration, essayed again to touch a stone but he could not alter the nature of the stone. Then went we with him to the temple of Bacchus, where we offered a lance wreathed about with ivy, 
garlands of bright grapes, skins of wolves and panthers, and a great standing cup of the water which so lately was turned to gold. Bacchus accepted our gifts, commanding Midas to honour the gods, and also in wishing to be as wise as he meant to have made him fortunate. Happy Sophronia, that hast lived to hear these news, and happy Midas, if thou live better to govern thy fortune. But what is become of our king? Midas, overjoyed with his good fortune, determined to use some solace in the woods, where by chance we roused a great boar. He, eager of the sport, outrid us, and we, thinking he had been come to his palace some other way, came ourselves the next way. If he be not returned, he cannot be long. Uh, we have also lost our pages, which we think are with him. The gods shield him from all harms. The woods are full of tigers, and he of courage. Wild beasts make no difference between a king and a clown, nor hunters in the heat of their past time fear no more the fierceness of the boar than the fearfulness of the hare. But hope well, let us in to see all well. And they... Exit. So it's an interesting sort of divertisement uh, scene where uh, various people are discussing what's uh, what's the, uh, the the best thing to do, um, and uh, the the conclusion seems to be whatever you like best. Uh, that's that's fine. People can do different things. That's okay. Uh, and then we get back to uh, someone enters and reminds everyone that there's a plot going on somewhere. <laughs> um, and uh, yes, uh, Midas uh, has been uh, sorted out off stage uh, at this midpoint in the play. Problem number one seems to have been solved, and, and I'm sure Midas will get up to no more jolly scrapes uh, in the ensuing uh, next half of the play. Uh, thoughts in the room about some of this, uh, Alan. I think there's possibly a bit of review needed on that sequence because in some cases what the various ladies have advocated is not there's a couple of there's do. a couple of errors uh, 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 that st stick to the chat for that uh, that that kind of thing yes there, there mm. are a few uh, there's a Camilla which should have been a a, 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 a Celia at one point and things like mm. that um, other things about uh, what's going on in the scene uh, while we liked um, uh, we had at least one appeal for a t-shirt line um, <laughs> but that's more taking a line slightly out of context and having fun with it um, uh, yeah Eric I was just gonna say so basically like um, we kind of it's like we've we've finished that chapter of like sort of action I guess and sort of so so we're gonna end up moving into something new so because we're in act four, the next one is act four, yeah. Um, but I, I think it's interesting because it's basically, are all the gods doubling with themselves? Or like sort of, is Bacchus doubling with Apollo or what? Who I'm, knows? I'm, I'm just, you know, <laughs> speculating. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. This is a sort of pivot scene, isn't it? It's, it deals with uh, stuff that's gone before and vaguely maybe setting up things that are about to come. Um, the uh, the prologue did talk about this uh, 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 this uh, question of uh, structure for how this story is being told. Um, and uh, yeah, if we present a mingle mangle, our fault is to be excused because the whole world is become a hodgepodge. So if you don't like structurally what's happening with this story, tough. Uh, Bryony. Um, I've just had to look back to see where we, where it was that we finished off yesterday, and it's a really nice um, contrast to what to to where we were with this sort of very masculine, silly, funny sort of scene, and now this is quite feminine and poetic, and and talking about all these womanly pursuits like love and dancing and stuff. Yeah, it's uh, uh, playing the kind of games that uh, L Lily uh, is interested in, Eric. Well, it's also a sort of a costume change scene because clearly it's between two scenes that are um, sort of, you know, they, like clearly Midas needs to go off and do whatever he's going to do. And the gods need to get ready and everyone else is going to like come on and so on and so forth. Hmm. 
Yeah, and it it gives us actually reasonable room for manoeuvre in terms of a modern production as well, you know, in the sense that the, 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 these elements are all quite nicely separated from each other. So there is actually room for manoeuvre to uh, who's playing what and why if in a modern production, which might have more doubling than the original one uh, may have done, because uh, there may have been plenty of parts to go around in the original. Uh, so, yeah, we're past, past uh, Act 3 going into Act 4. Other th thoughts at this stage? We're still warming up, so, you know, no pressure. You can hold on to thoughts. Aliki? I mean, it's, a, it's a nice little diversion, isn't it? I, I know they were played by, by boys, but still, you have these several pretty girls, we presume they're pretty because they're on stage, talking about love, talking about music, talking about dancing. It's a sort of little, it's like the, um, the sherbet in between courses at a fancy banquet, you know. Mm. Ah, and off we go. Palette cleanser, that's it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, it, and it, the, I, I like the fact that you know, it, it, the, the scene comes to its own conclusion. You know that you know people can enjoy the things that they like, and that's fine. And we don't have to authoritatively say you must like this. Um, and you know, so uh, that that gives us a lot of leeway to how 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 the uh, this. It's nice. It's nice to get some kind of answer there. Um, OK, let's dive into Act 4, Scene 1. There's some quite chunky scenes in Act 4. Act 4 is quite a chunky act. Uh, act 4, that's, most of the acts we've, you know, we had three scenes in Act 3, um, but the other two, we only had two, two apiece. So uh, Act 4 uh, has a lot more material to play with. And we suddenly have an, a, a string of gods turn up. Um, uh, we have Apollo. We have Pan. Uh, we have some, uh, some nymphs. Um, uh, Aratus, uh, Arato and uh, Thalia, um, and uh, and we're going to have Midas turning up anon. So Apollo and Pan primarily. Pan, wilt thou contend with Apollo, who tunes the heavens and makes them all hang by harmony? Orpheus that caused trees to move with the sweetness of his harp offereth yearly homage to my lute. So doth Arion that brought dolphins to his sugared notes, and Amphion that by music reared the walls of Thebes, only Pan, with his harsh whistle, which makes beasts shakes for, shake for fear, not man dance for joy, seeks to compare with Apollo. Pan is a god, Apollo is no more. Comparisons cannot be odious where the deities are equal. This pipe, my sweet pipe, was once a nymph, a fair nymph, once my lovely mistress, now my heavenly music. Tell me, Apollo, is there any instrument so sweet to play as on one's mistress? Had thy lute been of laurel and the strings of Daphne's hair, thy tunes might have been compared to my notes, for then Daphne would have added to thy stroke sweetness and to thy thoughts melody. Doth Pan talk of the passions of love, of the passions of divine love? <sighs> oh, that word Daphne wounds Apollo, pronounced by the barbarous mouth of Pan. I fear his breath will blast the fair green if I dazzle not his eyes that he may not behold it. My pipe, the nymph. Some hag, rather, haunting these shady groves and desiring not thy love, but the fellowship of such a monster. What god is Pan, but the god of beasts and woods and hills, excluded from heaven and in earth, not honoured? Break thy pipe, or with my sweet lute, Will I break thy heart? Let not love enter into those savage lips. A word for Jove, for Apollo, for the heavenly gods, whose thoughts are gods. The gods are all love. Apollo, I told thee before that Pan was a god. I tell thee now again, as great a god as Apollo. I had almost said a greater. And because thou shalt know I care not tell my thoughts, I say a greater. 
Pan feels the passions of love deeply engraven in his heart with us fair nymphs, with us great fortune, as Apollo, as Neptune, as Jove. And better than Pan can none describe love. Not Apollo, not Neptune, not Jove. My temple is in Arcady, where they burn continuous flames to Pan. In Arcady is mine oracle, where Erato the nymph giveth answers for Pan. In Arcady, the place of love is the honour of Pan. I, but I am the god of hills, so I am Apollo, and that of hills so high as I can pry into the juggling of the highest gods. Of woods, so I am Apollo, of woods so thick that thou with thy beams canst not pierce them. I know Apollo's prying, I know mine own jealousy. Sun and shadow cousin one another, be thou sun still, the shadow is fast at thy heels, Apollo. I as near to thy love as thou to mine. A carter, with his whistle and his whip in true ear, moves as much as Phoebus with his fiery chariot and winged horses. Love leaves are as well for country porridge as heavenly nectar. Love made Jupiter a goose and Neptune a swine and both for love of earthly mistresses. What hath made Pan or any god on earth for gods on earth can change their shapes, turn themselves for an heavenly goddess. Believe me, Apollo, our groves are pleasanter than your heavens, our milkmaids than your goddesses, our rude ditties to a pipe than your sonnets to a lute. Here is flat faith, a mo a mass where you cry, oh, utinam amarent vel non amasem. Aye, let pass Apollo thy hard words as calling Pan monster, which is as much as to call all monsters, for Pan is all, Apollo but one. But touch thy strings and let these nymphs decide. Those nymphs shall decide, unless thy rude speech hath made them deaf. Is there any other answer to Pan? Take this, that it becometh not Apollo to answer Pan. Pan is all and all is Pan. Thou art Pan and all, all Pan and tinkerly. But to this music, wherein all thy so shame shall be seen, and all my skill. Enter Midas. In the chase, I lost my company and missed the game too. I think Midas shall in all things be unfortunate. What is he that talketh? Uh, Midas, the unfortunate king of Phrygia. To be a king is next to being a god. Thy fortune is not so bad. What is thy folly? To abuse a god. An ungrateful part of a king. But, uh, <clears throat> Midas, seeing by chance thou art come, or sent by some god of purpose, none can in the earth better judge of gods than kings. Sit down with these nymphs. I am Apollo. This is Pan, both gods. We contend for sovereignty in music. Seeing it happens in earth, we must be judged by those on earth, in which there are none more worthy than kings and nymphs. Therefore, give ear that thy judgment err not. If gods you be, although I dare wish nothing of gods being so deeply wounded with wishing, yet let my judgment prevail before these nymphs, if we agree not, because I am a king. There must be no condition, but judge Midas and judge nymphs. <clears throat> and then thus I begin both my song and my play. And this is a song of Daphne to the lute. 
my Daphne's hair is twisted gold, bright stars apiece her eyes do hold. My Daphne's brow enthrones the graces, my Daphne's beauty stains all faces. On Daphne's cheek grow rose and cherry, on Daphne's lip a sweeter berry. Daphne's snowy hand but touched does melt, and then no heavenlier warm is felt. My Daphne's voice tunes all the spheres, my Daphne's music charms all ears. Fond am I thus to sing her praise, these glories now are turned to bays. O oh, divine Apollo, O oh, sweet consent! If the god of music should not be above our reach, who should? I like it not. Now let me tune my pipes. I cannot pipe and sing. That's the odds in the instrument, not the art. But I will pipe and then sing, and then judge both of the art and the instrument. So he pipes and then sings thusly. Pan's Strinix was a girl indeed, though now she's turned into a reed. From that dear reed, Pan's pipe doth come, a pipe that strikes Apollo dumb. Nor flute, nor lute, nor gittern can so chant it as the pipe of Pan. Cross gartered swains and dairy girls with faces smug and round as pearls. When Pan's shrill pipe begins to play with dancing wear out night and day. The bagpipes drone his hum lays by when Pan sounds up his minstrelsy. His minstrelsy, bass, this quill, which at my mouth with wind I fill, puts me in mind, though her I miss that still my Strinix lips I kiss. Hast thou done, Pan? I am done well, as I think. Now, nymphs, what say you? We all say that Apollo hath showed himself both a god and of music the god. Pan himself a rude satyr, neither keeping measure nor time, his piping as far out of tune as his body out of form. To thee, divine Apollo, we give the prize and reverence. But what says Midas? Methinks there's more sweetness in the pipe of Pan than Apollo's lute. I brook not that nice tickling of strings. That contents me that makes one start. At a shrillness came into, came into mine ears out of that pipe, and what a goodly noise it made. Apollo, I must needs judge that Pan deserves the most praise. Blessed be Midas worthy to be a god. These girls whose ears do but itch with daintiness give verdict without weighing the virtue. They have been brought up in chambers with soft music, not where I make the woods ring with my pipe, Midas. Wretched. Unworthy to be a king, thou shalt know what it is to displease Apollo. I will leave thee but the two last letters of thy name to be thy whole namer, which if thou canst not guess, thus I need information to tell thee. What hast thou done, Apollo? The ears of a, an ass upon the head of a king? And well worthy when the dullness of an ass is in the ears of a king. Help, Pan, or Midas perisheth. I cannot undo what Apollo hath done, nor give thee any amends, unless to thy ears thou wilt have added horns. It were very well, but it might be hard to judge whether he were more ox or ass. Farewell, Midas. Midas, farewell. Oh, Midas, why was not thy whole body metamorphosed that there might have been no part left of Midas? Where shall I shroud this shame? Or how may I be restored to mine old shape? Apollo is angry. Blame not Apollo, whom being god of music, thou didst both dislike and dishonor, preferring the barbarous noise of Pan's pipe before the sweet melody of Apollo's lute. 
If I return to Phrygia, I shall be pointed at. If I live in the woods, savage beasts must be my companions. And what other companions should Midas hope for than beasts, being all of beast himself, beast himself the dullest? Had it not been for thee to have perished by a golden death, then now to lead a beastly life, unfortunate in thy wish, unwise in thy judgment, first a golden fool, now a leaden ass. What will they say in Lesbos if happily these news come to Lesbos? If they come, Midas, yes, report flies as swift as thoughts, gathering wings in the air and doubling rumors by her own running. In so much as having here the ears of an ass, it will be told, all my hairs are asses ears. Then will this be the byword. Is Midas that sought to be a monarch of the world become the mock of the world? Are his golden are his golden mines turned into water as free for everyone that will fetch as for himself that possessed them by wish? Ah, poor Midas. Are his conceits become blockish, his counsels unfortunate, his judgments unskillful? Ah, foolish Midas, a just reward for thy pride to wax poor, for thy overweening to wax dull, for thy ambition to wax humble. For thy cruelty to say, sisque miser semper, miser semper nexis miserabilis uli. But I must seek to cover my shame by art. Lest once discovered by these petty kings of Mysia, Pisidia, Galatia, they all join to add to mine ass's ears of all beasts the dullest, a sheep's heart of all beasts of fearfulest. So cast lots for those kingdoms that I have won with so many lives and kept with so, so many envies. And exit Midas. There's no stage direction uh, indicating precisely when the ears get, uh, the ass's ears get added, but uh, well acted to indicate precisely where that happened. Uh, we, we may have lost a couple of nymphs uh, in there. Um, it goes to show that uh, the concept of cue scripts don't always uh, uh, work desperately well for uh, uh, some plays, um, uh, uh, because I think, uh, yes, the farewell Midas, Midas farewell, it happens twice, and so I think that uh, causes us to slightly jump over second and third nymph. Um, so um, I'll just ask second and third nymph and uh, uh, Rato et al. to uh, to cue themselves up again, because we'll, we'll very briefly do that in a moment, uh, while we just uh, come up with uh, a few witty wisecracks to throw in. Yes, it is Midas does X Factor, isn't it? Um... <laughs> It's a no from me. I mean, he, you know, there's no, he's no um, sort of trying to lighten the blow at any point. You know, I like it not. No, it's not for me. Um, whereas the gods are really polite. I mean, I love Apollo's line. Uh, I am Apollo. This is Pan. Uh, how do you do? And um, yes, uh, it's lovely to meet you. Uh, yes, uh, my card. Uh, he's, they're, they're really, really, really polite. Uh, whereas he's just really rude. <laughs> I'm sorry. And everybody else understands the, the, the rules of the game here and um, how it works. But yeah. Um, but yes, episode two, as it were, the second half of this play is very much sticking uh, reasonably closely to the, uh, the, 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 the other part of the Midas story, uh, the ass's ears and how, uh, how it comes about, um, uh, at least in uh, overall shape. Um, so, yeah, um, if the nymphs are, 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 are lined up... Um, Second nymph, I, I, I warrant they be. I'd just like to hear those lines because there's some good lines in there. So uh, the nymphs are making fun of Midas uh, and his, his ears as they exit. I warrant they be dainty, dainty ears. Nothing can please them but Pan's pipe. He hath the advantage of all ears except the mouse. For else there's none so sharp of hearing as the ass. Farewell, Midas. Midas, farewell. Farewell, Midas. 
Yes, it's 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 really it's really rather fun. Um, and uh, yes, um, yes, the the mocking nymphs who haven't had uh, necessarily had that much to do, uh, a few one-liners and things throughout that. And yes, I think we can safely rename first nymph as Arato and second nymph as uh, as probably Thalia. Third nymph, goodness only knows. Um, third nymph is just third nymph. That's what's going on your CV. There's nothing we can do about that. Um, you frozeny. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? Well, the other two amuses, so it should be amuse. Yeah, but that, that, yeah, it's that that question of uh, how they're being. Th some t terms are being thrown around in quite loose ways. I think. Um, uh, thoughts in the room, anyway, about this fun scene. There's some really good stuff in this, uh, Rachel. And then Eric. Well, uh, I was going to say the nymphs. Maybe I, I maybe they are nymphs, and they're the supposed to be the attendants on the muses, you know, to show their um, I don't know high hierarchical status as you know some sort of royalty amongst the gods, or to give them more of a royal lady feel. Uh, Aliki wants to jump in the there. Muses are nymphs, technically. I think a muse is, is just a, a subset of nymphs. They're the particular nymphs that follow Apollo around. So it works fine, as yeah. is. Aren't they the daughters of Apollo? It depends. Um, oh. <laughs> mostly not. There so might you, be a version where they are. I, I think we can. what we can say, if you put the name and nymph on a letter, it will get to them. <laughs> uh, you know, that's fine. Um, uh, Eric... <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to say, is it me or is it that innuendo, nothing can please them but Pan's pipe or what? I mean, yeah. No, I think it's innuendo. I, 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 I'm always inclined to say that Lily, uh, innuendo, highly probable. Um, uh, it may not be going for the FNAF, FNAF level, um, but, you know, it doesn't mean the, the, the double entendre isn't there. Emma? Uh, I just really love the line where Pan basically said, I can't get rid of the ears, but I could add horns. If that makes it better, no. Okay. <laughs> um, but no, I, I do, I do feel a bit sorry for Midas in this one because Apollo was never going to take losing graciously, and I suppose it's because Midas doesn't understand the, um, the divine order. Is that it? Apollo has to win because he's the god of music. Is that, is that what Midas is failing to, um, uh, acknowledge? Yeah, and also just Pan's going to be flogging these awful CDs on on the street for. I mean, it's just good. It's, it's 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 a terrible, terrible crisis of uh, uh, the, of music that we we won't get away from for decades. Uh, Lois, there's some sort of musical hierarchy as well. Stringed music over wind music. I don't know. It just seems likely. Uh, I like the pun on Pan too. You know, the reference to Tinkers in connection with Pan. Several. <laughs> mm. um, Sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. Go, Leaky. Um, that whole kind of bit about pan meaning everything, which is just Greek. In Greek, pan means everything. It's yeah. also the syllable that means um, animals, wild animals, so that he's the equivalent of fauna, a fawn. But they, they had so much fun with like three different meanings for pan. And oh, I, I do love a bilingual pun. <laughs> uh, Helen. Yeah, there's also somewhere in there uh, panic fear. Um, I, I'm sure I saw it somewhere as we were going through. Hmm. Uh, Lynn. Yeah, I just I was before Midas even comes on. I was really struck by Pan's boast of being, you know. A greater god. I mean, he's not. He's like Pan is. Is like not even. I mean, are satyrs even immortals? So I mean, it, is this supposed to be funny? It's just I don't know what to make of it. But it, it really, it. I found it really striking that Pan is making this these boasts of being, uh, good as anybody, good as Neptune, good as Joe. Like, no, you're not. What's going on here? Yeah, it's it's that sort of um, uh, boasting you get before a fight. You know, I'm the greatest. You know, the underdogs coming in and are really going for it. Aliki, then Stephen. So I haven't really looked into mythology in a very long time, but in my recollection, that fits with Pan's okay. role in the myth, where he's always he's an outcast, but he's always a bit of a like, yeah, I'm as good as you are. In terms of Lily's kind of um, structure. I wonder whether what he's saying is that 
wildness and nature is powerful because that's really what Pan stands for. He's the uncultivated land, the wild woods, hunting, not animal husbandry and farming kind of rural. Hmm. Uh, uh, other thoughts before we go uh, further on? Eric, then Rachel. Oh, sorry, so Stephen, then Eric, then Rachel. Uh, well, I was, I was kind of going to say the same thing, really. Uh, it, uh, Pan is Earth, isn't he? Of the Earth, and Apollo is of the heaven. That seems to be one of the divisions. So, you know, where is nature, but down here, as it were. That's all. Uh, okay, uh, that's that's great. I, and that really makes that makes it, 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 it this, this is actually a nature versus civilization debate. It's sort of those large there's concepts of, of of nature versus the civilized world and that's so consistent with what i have think i've seen in lily that he's really interested in these sort of large philosophical questions like what does it mean to be human what does it mean to be civilized what is it what yeah what do we do about the problems of human desire so i mean he's very thinky you know so um that sort of intellectual debate uh thing that he likes to do is going on here so that yeah that 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 makes sense uh, awesome. Eric, then Rachel. I, I was going to say that it seems more like rural versus like sort of nobility because he does go, our milk milkmaids, then your goddesses are rude ditties to a pipe, then your sonnets to a lute, which is basically like the sort of um, the instruments and amusements of the peasantry. I don't know if that you could say that or like sort of rural stuff uh, <laughs> versus sort of what's at court i'm guessing i don't know but i don't i don't know if that's just stretching it too uh rachel no um it's kind of similar to what what other people have been saying but in i i know like the there was a movement in art you know there was the northern renaissance and there was the the one that was going on in italy and and germany was big on you know pan's imagery because they had a lot of forests and stuff like that and so it's kind of like what other people were saying of how it's like you know this more civilized manners and then um you know this more rural attitude and I wonder if that you know the, these movements that were happening in art around the same time you know were affecting this or if or if I'm or if I'm just going too deep into this scene <laughs> That's fine. Uh, we're, 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 we're all allowed to uh, see how everything flows together. Um, we will, uh, talking about things flowing together, I'm going to let the next few scenes run into each other because they're effectively in the same place uh, as they go. Um, so uh, we'll see how the, the action goes uh, with a, a little bit of steam behind it. So Act 4, Scene 2, Enter Five Shepherds, because we've been waiting for some shepherds, haven't we? Uh, that's what this place has been missing out of the usual uh, pantheon. So uh, Menalcus, uh, Corin, uh, Kelthus, uh, Dryapon, and Amentas all enter enter the shepherds. I muse what the news. I muse what the nymphs meant that it so sang in the groves. Midas of Phrygia hath ass's ears. I marvel not, for one of them plainly told me he had ass's ears. Aye, but it is not safe to say it. He is a great king, and his hands are longer than his ears. Therefore, for us that keep sheep, it is wisdom enough to tell sheep. Tis true. Yet, since Midas grew so mischievous as to blur his diadem with blood, which should blister with nothing but pity, and so miserable that he made gold his god, that was framed to be his slave, many broad speeches have uh, flown abroad. In his own country they stick not to call him tyrant and elsewhere usurper. They flatly say that he eateth into other dominions as the sea doth into the land, not knowing that in swallowing a poor island as big as Lesbos, he may cast up three territories thrice as, brig, uh, thrice as big as Phrygia. For what the sea winneth in the marsh, it loseth in the sand. Take me with you, but speak softly. For these reeds may have ears and hear us. Suppose they have, yet they may be without tongues to bury us. Nay, let them have tongues too. 
when we have art we have eyes to see that they have none and therefore if they hear and speak they know not from whence it comes well then this i say when a lion doth so much degenerate from the princely kind that he will borrow of the beasts i say he is no lion but a monster pieced with the craftiness of the fox the cruelty of the tiger the ravening of the wolf the dissembling of the hyena he is worthy also to have the ears of an ass he seeks to conquer lesbos and like a foolish gamester having a bag full of his own ventures it all to win a groat of another he that fishes for Lesbos must have such a wooden net as all the trees in Phrygia will not serve to make the cod, nor all the woods in Pisidia provide the corks. Nay, he means to angle for it with an hook of gold and bait of gold, and so to strike the fish with a pleasing bait that will slide out of an open net. All those islanders are too subtle to nibble at it at craft and too rich to swallow treasure if that be his hope he may as well dive to the bottom of the sea and bring up an anchor of a thousand weight as plod with his gold to corrupt a people so wise and besides a nation as i have heard so valiant that are readier to strike than ward more than all this amintas though we dare not so much as mutter it their king is such a one as dazzleth the clearest eyes with majesty, daunteth the valiantest hearts with courage, and for virtue filleth all the world with wonder. If beauty go beyond sight, confidence above valor, and virtue above, and, and virtue exceed miracle, what is it to be thought? But that Midas goeth to undermine that by the simplicity of man that is fastened to a rock by the providence of the gods. We poor commons who, tasting war, are made to relish nothing but taxes, can do nothing but grieve, to see things unlawful practised, to obtain tilings impossible. All his minds do but gild his comb, to make it glister in the wars, and cut ours that are forced to follow him in his wars. <laughs> well, that must be borne, not blamed, that cannot be changed. For my part, if I may enjoy the fleece of my silly flock with quietness, I will never care three flocks for his ambition. Let this suffice, we may talk too much, and being overheard be all undone. I am so jealous that methinks the very reeds bow down as though they listen to our talk, and soft. I hear some coming. Let us in and meet at a place more meet. And they exit and at this place uh, with many reeds enters uh, Lichio, uh, Petalus, uh, Minutius, Huntsman, uh, some of whom we have met before as servant type people. Is not hunting a tedious occupation? Aye, and troublesome, for if you call a dog a dog, you are undone. You be both fools, besides base-minded. Hunting is for kings, not peasants. Such as you are unworthy to be hounds, much less huntsmen, that know not when a hound is fleet, fair flued and well hanged, being ignorant of the deepness of a hound's mouth and the sweetness. I hope, sir, a cur's mouth is no deeper than the sea, nor sweeter than a honeycomb. Pretty coxcomb. A hound will swallow these easily as a great pit, a small pebble. Indeed, hunting were a pleasant sport. But the dogs make such a barking that one cannot hear the hounds cry. I'll make thee cry if I catch thee in the forest. Thou shalt be lashed. What's that? Dost thou not understand their language? Not I. Tis the best calamance in the world, as easily deciphered as the characters in a nutmeg. I pray thee speak some. I will. But speak in order, or I'll pay you. Do it, Petulus. There was a boy leashed on the single, because when he was embossed, he took soil. What's that? Why? A boy was beaten on the tail with a leathern thong, because when he foamed at the mouth with running, he went into the water. This is worse than Fustian. Mum, you were best. Hunting is an honourable pastime, and for my part, 
I had as lief hunt a deer in a park as caught a lady in a chamber. Give me a pasty for park and let me shake off a whole kennel of teeth for hounds. Then shalt thou see a notable champing. After that I will carouse a bottle of, a bowl of wine. And so in the stomach let the venison take soil. He hath laid the plot to be prudent. Why, tis pasty crust. Eat enough and it will make you wise, is an old proverb. Aye, and eloquent. For you must tipple wine freely and fecundi calices can non fecere desertum. Fecere desertum. Leave off these toys. And let us seek out Midas, whom we lost in the chase. I'll warrant he hath by this started a covey of books or roused a skull of pheasants. Treason to two brave sports, banking and hunting. Thou should say, start a hare, rouse the deer, spring the oh, partridge. Warren, that was devised by some country swad, that seeing a hare skip up, which made him start, he presently said, he started the hare. Aye, and some lubber lying beside a spring and seeing a partridge come by, said he did spring the partridge. Well, remember all remember this. Remember all? Nay then, we had, nay then, had we good memories, for there be more phrases than thou hast heard. But let me see. I pray thee, what's this about thy neck? A bugle. If it had stood on thy head, I should have called it a horn. Well, tis hard to have one's brows embroidered with bugle. But canst thou blow it? What else? But not away. No, twill make Boreas out of breath to blow his homes away. There was good blowing, I'll warrant, before they came here. Well, tis a shrewd blow. Spare your winds in this, or I'll wind your necks in a cord. But soft, I heard my master's blast. Summer felt it. Thy mother, when such a fly blow was buzzed out, but I must be gone. I perceive Midas is come. And exit the huntsman. Then let us not tarry, for now shall we shave the barber's house. The world will grow full of wiles, seeing Midas hath lost his golden wish. I care not. My head shall dig devices, and my tongue stamp them, so as my mouth shall be a mint, and my brains are mine. Then help us to cousin the barber. Barber shall know every hair of my chin to be as good as a choke pair for his purse. And they exit, and into this same hunting situation we have the entrance of uh, uh, Melocrites, Martius, and Aristus. Okay. I'm somebody different now. Marvel what Midas meaneth to be so melancholy since his hunting. It is a good word in Midas, otherwise I should term it in another blockishness. I cannot tell whether it be a sourness commonly incident to age or a severeness particular to the kings of Phrygia or a suspicion cleaving to great estates. But methinks he seemeth so jealous of us all and becomes so overthwart to all others that either I must conjecture his wits are not his own or his meaning very hard to some. My part I neither care nor wonder. I see all his expeditions for wars are laid in water. And now when he should execute, he begins to consult and suffers the enemies to bid us good morrow at our own doors, to whom we long since might have given the last good night in their own beds. He weareth, I know not whether for warmth or wantonness, a great tiara on his head, as though his head were not heavy enough unless he loaded it with great rolls but I never used that I could hear of, but of old women, of pelting priests. This will make Pisidia wanton, Lyconia stiff, all his territories wavering. And he that hath couched so many kingdoms in one crown will have his kingdom scattered into as many crowns as he possesses countries. I will rouse him up, and if his ears be not as his ears, I will make them tingle. I respect not my life, I know it's my duty, and certainly, I dare swear, war is my profession. 
marshes. So we will all join. And though I have been, as in Phrygia they term, a brave courtier, that is, as they expound it, a fine lover, yet will I set both aside love and courting and follow marshes, for never shall it be said, Bella Garant Ali, Semper Aristis Amet. And I, Martius, that honored gold for a god and counted all other gods but lead, will follow Martius and say, Vilius Argentum est auro, your tutibus aurum. My lords, I give you thanks and I'm glad for there are no stouter soldiers in the world than those that are made of lovers, <laughs> nor any more liberal in wars than they that in peace have been covetous. Then doubt not if courage and coin can prevail, but we shall prevail. And besides, nothing can prevail but fortune. Well, here comes Sophronia. I'll first talk with her. Enter Sophronia, Camilla, and Marula. Madam, either our king hath no ears to hear or no care to consider, both in what state we stand being his subjects and what danger he is in being our king. Duty is not regarded. Courage condemned, either careless of us and of his own safety. Martius, I mislike not thy plain dealing, but pity my father's trance. A trance I must call that, where nature cannot move, nor counsel, nor music, nor physic, nor danger, nor death, nor all. But that which maketh me most both to sorrow and wonder is that music a Mithridat for melancholy should make him mad, crying still, uno namke modo pan e et Apollo no sent. None hath access to him but motto, as though melancholy were to be shaven with a razor, not cured with a medicine, but stay. What noise is this in those reeds? Sound is this. Who dares utter that he hears? I dare, Melocrites. The words are plain. Midas the king hath ass's ears. It is strange, and yet to be told the king. So dare I, Camilla, for it, concer it, concer for it concerneth me in duty, and us all in discretion. But soft, let us hearken better. Midas of Phrygia hath ass's ears. This is monstrous, and either portends some mischief to the king or unto the state confusion. Midas of Phrygia has ass's ears. It is impossible. Let us with speed to the king to know his resolution, for to some oracle lie <clears throat> they must send. Till his majesty be acquainted with this matter, we dare not root out the reeds himself must both hear the sound and guess at the reason. Unfortunate Midas, that being so great a king, there should out of the earth spring so great a shame. It may be that his wishing for gold, being but dross of the world, is by all the gods accounted foolish, and so discovered out of the earth. For a king to thirst for gold instead of honour Prefer heaps of worldly coin before triumphs in warlike conquests, with in my mind no princely mind. Let us not debate the cause, but seek to prevent the snares, for in my mind it foretelleth that which woundeth my mind. Let us in. And they exit. And yeah, these three interlocking scenes are doing an awful lot of business that I really, really like. I have to say, I, I, it's, we've 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 got an introduction as to why the barber was introduced earlier in the comedy scene. Uh, it wasn't just for random co uh, company. Uh, it's the only person that uh, that uh, Midas is going to actually talk to. Um, everything's going to rack and ruin. The lords here are really not happy with the state of the kingdom. Um, the uh, uh, we've got various people. Even the shepherds have heard the news because you can't shut those sodding nymphs up, can you? <coughs> nah, I mean, you know, it's like, oh yeah, I've I've, I've heard it sung in the groves. And no, 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 one of the nymphs actually came up and told me. It just went to my face. So you know, <laughs> um, so we're getting it from the the shepherds. We're getting it from the servants who spend most of scene three going, I hate hunting. I oh, know hunting's all right. And then hang on, 
Uh, let us seek out Midas, whom we lost in the chase. Yeah, do you remember that play we're in? Let's go back and do do some stuff about the play um, <laughs> and mention some plot stuff in passing while we continue with the banter. So there does seem to be something interestingly detachable from these servant scenes, that they start with stuff that is if utterly irrelevant, apart from that it's just sort of fun. And then they start sort of filtering back into, oh, yes, they actually serve a overall general plot function. Uh, Lois. Yeah, there's some rather fun stuff about hunting jargon. And I don't recall seeing this before in plays we've read. I mean, some later plays get quite fascinated with it, with usually with, uh, I think, thieves cans. But uh, this is the first time I think I've seen people talking about a sort of specialized vocabulary and making fun of it. Mm. Uh, Helen. Yeah, we had it in Galatea, though, it is. off and on. Uh, because first of all, it was the Mariners, oh, yeah. and then it was the um, uh, uh, Alchemists. Oh, yeah. mm. and we had we had all sorts of technical vocabulary, and they weren't going to serve the person because they couldn't master mm. the vocabulary. Right. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing, isn't it? I mean, the pages uh, yeah. in a kind of schoolroom yeah. situation, but a sort of a parody of it. Mm. Uh, Stephen. Yeah. I, 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 I think yesterday, I can't remember if it was Rob or somebody else, they, they suggested there might be a, an association of Midas with, with Spain. Mm, that seems yeah. to be operating here as well with the shepherds because they, 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 uh, they told this stuff about Lesbos, which is, you know, you can't, you can't get these guys with gold. Mm. Uh, they're too subtle. These islanders are a hardy race. Yeah. Midas, king, you know, so I, I think there's, a, there's another sort of weird little, because the first half of first bit of theirs is just kind of standard comedy shtick which is you know a, a reed herd who cares of a reed herd you know they haven't got eyes to see who said it it's all kind of it's very marx brothers actually and then they go into this sort of kind of you know lesbos shall never never be slaves or something like that you know but it, but that's a callback to I, I can't remember who spotted it but somebody mentioned it on yeah. the read i think it was lois right um yeah, it's um, yeah, it's that 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 sort of thing of uh, you know these are uh, four, uh, uh, five shepherds uh, you know potentially saying you know uh, dangerous political discussion here. Uh, let's say it's surrounded by some reeds. <laughs> uh, that's that's always the the where where all major uh, uh, meeting meetings of underground uh, uh, meetings uh, happen. And uh, yeah, for the viewers at home, of course, uh, the random burst of my um, uh, of Phrygia have asses ears that was literally said by the reeds. Uh, the, uh, how the reeds talk, we don't know. There's a hint that the reeds do sort of mechanical leaning down and listening comedy moment as well. They sort of say it. They only say it's it's like they they're listening to us, but I think that should be a physical thing, and I think there should be a mechanical prop that does something fun. You know, we know that that Lily has an interest in mechanical things happening with trees, so reeds doesn't see, seem that far outside of uh, outside of his uh, wheelhouse. Rachel, then Eric. Um, no, I was going to ask, is is Pan's, like, pipe, is it a reed pipe? Could it be, like, a double entendre, like it's Pan through the reeds playing his pipe and saying that, coming through, parting them hmm. as well? well. Uh, do, do, Lee, could you want to touch on that? Well, one, it doesn't make sense because Pan likes Midas. Midas said his music was great. Hmm. Um, to yeah, Pan's pipe is a reed. He told us about it in the song. It was a girl he loved who got turned into reeds, and he cut her up and plays her <laughs> hollow bones, which is totally not creepy at all. No, no it's fine. Oh, it's fine. We do it every day. every day. Um, <laughs> it's perfectly normal. Eric, then Bryony. I was just wondering if like, because if this is a boys' company play, then maybe like the smallest kids are are dressed up as reads like sort of like a school play <laughs> it, like and some really crap christmas school play i once um, played a tree yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean i put yeah same um and like sort of to give them something to do he's just like turned them into reeds yeah. I, 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 I just just for the record i was a very good tree as well uh, oh. I, there was positive trade unionist unionist. I, I'm sure. Um, I, it, was, it was a my first first major role. Uh, I was eight. Uh, Bryony. Yeah, just that read bit. Like I don't know. To my mind, he he sort of ruined his own thing there because somebody else says it first. Like I just I don't I don't really get how he's 
yeah, like I say, to me, he's he's ruined it. Like, it's quite funny that the reads are just randomly saying King Midas, it's got ass's ears. But like, Sophronia Sofer- said it first and just, mm. I don't know, it's just a bit weird. Well, it's that thing about plain dealing, you know, you've 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 come to me, uh, Martius and, and, and all the others are, uh, about the complaints of the kingdom, etc. And so plain dealing back. It's one thing for courtiers and nobility to say things to each other. It is another thing, I think, for the reeds to be telling everybody. I think there's, there's sort of a different different logic there because the reeds will t- tell anyone. Um, and it's a variation on the original myth as well, uh, I think, of the... Uh, I, I think uh, the the original. Uh, well, there's variations on the story anyway, so uh, I, I uh, you know, uh, we can come to that detail another another time. Uh, Stephen, uh, were you wanting to leap in? Uh, yeah, it was just a comment. Um, I really, really want to see Midas's hat. It's the <laughs> image that that conjures up of somebody who's got something on their head that's big enough to ha- hide a pair of ass's ears. <laughs> Uh, and it, 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 it's a sort of counterpoint because the last time we heard of Midas, sort of an offstage description, was all this mystical stuff about gold and, and bathing and, and cups of water and all the rest. And then the description of him here is this bloke who's got this ginormous towel on his head, like he's just been washing his hair or something, you know. And he's just, <laughs> shall we mention that to him? Or oh, maybe not. And it's, it's, it's Martius is a totally straight character. And then in the middle of it, he just goes, and I don't know why he's got this great tiara on his head. <laughs> Can't make any sense of that. Anyway, I'll speak in his ears and ask him. <laughs> yeah, kind of... uh, Lynn. Maybe I'm I'm misreading what's going on in these scenes, but it looks it it seems to me that there are two groups of people who hear this rumor and are, and are like, oh my god, the king's got donkey's ears, and the courtiers when they hear about it, they can't seem to get their heads around the fact that it's literally true. They think it's gotta be some kind of metaphor. Uh, like, oh, I wonder what this means. Like, no, it's just literally true. But they, <laughs> but they seem to think it's like some kind of a, it's symbolic. <laughs> no, it's, it's just true. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to now crash into Act Five. If you have additional thoughts, hold on to them. We will. We will. I'm sure come back to them. Um, so uh, we have uh, possibly the same location, uh, but a different act. There may have been a bit of a, a musical break or something before Act Five continues. And what we have here is the entrance of Midas, um, and we can't. He he doesn't have a hat on or whatever he's got on his head at this moment. Um, we're going to get an additional description of how we're going to have to make these ears. Um, uh, which uh, is, uh, is getting a bit ready break in a moment uh, with uh, Sophorina, Melacrites and Martius in this scene. Oh, Sophronia, thou seest I am become a shame to the world and a wonder. Mine ears glow, <laughs> mine ears. Ah, uh-huh, miserable Midas, to have such ears as to make thy cheeks blush, thy head monstrous and thy heart desperate. Yet in blushing I am impudent, for I walk in the streets. In deformity, I seem comely, for I have left off my tiara, and my heart, the more heavy it is for grief, the more hope it conceiveth of recovery. <laughs> Dread sovereign and loving sire, there are nine days past, and therefore the wonder is over. There are many years to come, and therefore a remedy to be hoped for. Though the ear, though your ears be long, yet is there room left on your head for a diadem. Though they resemble the ears of the dullest beast, yet should they not doubt, yet should they not daunt the spirit of so great a king? The gods daily with men, the gods dally with men. Kings are no more; they disgrace kings, lest least they should be thought gods. Sacrifice pleaseth them, so that if you know by the oracle what god wrought it you shall, by humble submission, by that God be released. Sophronia, I commend thy care and courage, but let me hear these reeds, that these loathsome ears may be glutted with the report, and that is as good as a remedy. Midas of Phrygia hath ass's ears. Midas of Phrygia hath ass's ears, so he hath, unhappy Midas. If these reeds sing my shame so loud, Will men whisper it softly? No, all the world already rings of it. And as impossible, 
it is to, as impossible as it is to stay the rumor as to catch the wind in a net that bloweth in the air or to stop the wind of all men's mouths that breathe out air, I will to Apollo, whose oracle must be my doom, and I fear me my dishonor, because my doom was his, if kings may disgrace gods, and gods they disgrace when they forget their duties. What saith Midas? Nothing, but that Apollo must determine all, or Midas, to see mine of all, to Apollo will I offer an ivory lute for this sweet, for his sweet harmony, and berries of bay as black as jet for his love Daphne, pure simples for his physic, and continual incense for his prophesying. Apollo may discover some odd riddle, but not give the redress. For yet did I never hear that his oracles were without doubtfulness, nor his remedies without impossibilities. This superstition of yours is able to bring errors among the common sort not ease to your discontented mind dost thou not know martius that when bacchus commanded me to bathe myself in pactolus thou thoughtest it a mere mockery before thine eyes thou sawest the remedy i bacchus gave the wish and therefore was like also to give the remedy and who knows whether apollo may uh, whether Apollo gave me these ears and therefore may re release the punishment. Well, reply not, for I will to Delphos. And in meantime, let it be proclaimed that if there be any so cunning that can tell the reason of these reeds creaking, he shall have my daughter to his wife, or if she refuseth, a dukedom for his pains. And withal, that whosoever is so bold as to say that Midas has at his ears shall presently lose his. Dear father, then go forwards, prepare for the sacrifice, and dispose of Sophronia as it best pleaseth you. Come, let us in. Yeah, you can see the posters now, can't you? You say, if you say Midas has got asses ears, we'll chop your ears off. Um, it's practically a Scarfolk uh, poster campaign, isn't it? Um... Yeah, uh, I also love the fact, yeah, uh, anyone who can tell the reason the Reeds Creek, you can have my daughter to your wife, unless she says no, in which case I'll just give you a dukedom. Um, you know, just like, it's like tongue was running ahead of thinking there. Um, I was just going, oh yeah, I should really ask first. Yeah, okay, no, maybe not, maybe not. Uh, yeah, um, Midas is blushing with shame. Um, they can see the ears. He can't keep it hidden any longer. It's a, it's a bad day for Midas. But he doesn't uh, want he... to admit what he did. He's still kind of, oh, well, mm. it could have been Apollo, so maybe it'll work. <laughs> yeah, got some got some gifts, and uh, hopefully it'll be fine. Yeah, let's, let's hope that'll be fine. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, it's a short scene. Uh, we will move on to Act 5, Scene 2. Yes, we may finish the whole play this session. My goodness me so uh, act five scene two we're going back to our uh, favorite uh, comedy double acts uh we've got uh Licio and Pe petulus what a rascal was motto to cousin us and say there were 30 men in a room that would undo us and when all came to all they were but table men aye and then to give us an inventory of all his goods only to redeem the beard but we will be even with him, and I'll be forsworn, but I'll be revenged. And here I vow by my concealed beard, if ever it chance to be discovered to the world, that it may make a pictivant. I will have it so sharp pointed that it shall stab motto like a poinado. And I protest by these hairs on my head, which are but casualties for alas, who knows not how soon they are lost. Autumn shaves like a razor. If these locks be rooted against wind and weather, spring and fall, I swear they shall not be lopped, till motto by my knavery be so bald that I may write verses on his scalp. In witness whereof, I eat this hair. Now must thou, Petulus, kiss thy beard, for that, for that was the book thou swarest by. Nay, I would I could come but to kiss my chin, 
which is as yet the cover of my book, but my word shall stand. Now, let us read the inventory. We'll share it equally. What else? An inventory of all mottos, movable bads and goods, as also of such debts as are owing him, with such household stuff as cannot be removed. In Primus, in the bedchamber, one foul wife and five small children. I'll not share in that. I am content. Take thou all. These be his movable bads. And from me they shall be removables. Item. In the servant's chamber, two pair of cursed queen's tongues. Tongues, thou wouldst say? Nay, they pinch worse than tongues. They are movables, I'll warrant. Item. One pair of homes in the bride chamber, on the bed's head. The beast's head? For motto is stuffed in the head, and these are among unmovable get goods. Well, felix quem faciunt aliena pericula uh, cortum. Happy are they whom other men's homes do make to beware. Item, a broken pate owing me by one of the coal house for notching his head like a chessboard. Take thou that, and I'll give thee all the rest of his debts. Noli me tangere, I refuse the executorship because I will not meddle with his desperate debts. Item, an hundred shrewd turns owing me by the pages in the corner because I will not trust them for trimming. That's due debt. Well, because motto is poor, they shall be paid him cum recumbentibus. All the pages shall enter into reconnaissance, but ecce Pippinetta chants it. Indeed, enter Pippinetta, who's singing, but you don't have to sing, you can just say. Lass, how long shall I and my maiden head lie in a cold bed all the night long? I cannot abide it, yet away cannot chide it, though I find it does me some wrong. Can any one tell where this fine thing doth dwell that carries not nor form nor fashion? It both heats and cools, tis a babble for fools, yet catched at, at, catched at in every nation. Say a maid were so crossed as to see this toy lost, cannot hew and cry fetch it again. Lass, no, for tis driven, nor to hell, nor to heaven. When tis found, tis lost even then. Hey ho, would I were a witch that I might be a duchess. I know not whether thy fortune is to be a duchess, but sure I am thy face serves thee well for a witch. What's the matter? The matter? Marry, tis proclaimed that whosoever can tell the cause of the reed song shall either have Sophronia to wife or, if she refuse it, a dukedom for his wisdom. Besides, whosoever saith that Midas hath, Midas hath ass's ears shall lose theirs. I'll be a duke. I find honour to bud in my head, and methinks every joint of mine arms, from the shoulder to the little finger, says, send for the herald. Mine arms are all armory, ghouls, sables, azure, or vert, pure, post, pare, etc. And my heart is like a hearth where Cupid is making a fire, for Sophronia shall be my wife. Methinks Venus and nature stand with each of them a pair of bellows, the one cooling my low birth, the other kindling my lofty affections. Apollo will help me because I can sing. Mercury me, because I can lie. All the gods me, because I can lie, sing, swear, and love. But soft, here comes motto. Now shall we have a fit time to be revenged, if by device we can make him say, my just hath at his ears. Enter motto. Let us not seem to be angry about the inventory, and you shall see my wit to be the hangman for his tongue. Why, fools, hath a barber a tongue? We'll make him have a tongue, that his teeth that look like a comb shall be the scissors to cut it off. I pray, let me have the odd ends. I fear nothing so much as to be tongue toward. Thou shalt have the shavings, and then a woman's tongue, up with a barber's will, prove a razor or a rasher. How now, motto? What? All a mort? I'm as melancholy as a cat. Oh, melancholy. Mary Gop is melancholy a word for a barber's mouth. Thou shouldst say heavy, dull, and doltish. Melancholy 
is the crest of courtier's arms, and now every base companion, being in his mubble fubbles, says he is melancholy. Motto, thou should say thou art lumpish. If thou encroach upon our courtly terms, we'll trounce thee. Belike, if thou should spit often, thou wouldst call it room. Motto, in men of reputation and credit, it is the room. In such mechanical mushrooms, it is a catar, a pose, the water evil. You were best wear a velvet patch on your temples, too. What a world it is to see eggs forwarder than cocks. These infants are as cunning in disease as I, that have run them over all, backward and forward. Tell you, boys, it is melancholy that now troubleth me. My master could tickle you with diseases, and that old ones that have continued in his ancestors' bones these three hundred years, he is the last of his family that is left uneaten. What means that? He means you are the last of the stock alive, the rest the worms have eaten. Yeah, a pox of these saucy worms that eat men before they be dead. But tell us, motto, why art thou sad? The court is sad. Why are all they sad in court? Because the king hath a pain in his ears. Belike it is the wens. Maybe. His ears are swollen very big. Ten to one, motto knows of the ass's ears. If he knows it, we shall. For it is hard for a barber to keep a secret in his mouth as a burning coal in his hand. Thou shalt see me wring it out by wit. Motto, t'was told me that the king will discharge you of your office because you cut his ear when you last trimmed him. <laughs> Tis a lie. If I had, he might well spare an inch or two. Well, out, I feel him coming. Master, take heed. You will blab all anon. These wags are crafty. Let me alone. Uh, why, Motto, what difference between the king's ears and thine? As much as between an ass's ears and mine. Oh, motto is modest. To mitigate the matter, he calls his own ears ass's ears. No, I mean the kings are ass's ears. Treason! Treason! Oh, I told you, master, you've made a fair hand, for now you have made your lips scissors to cut off your ears. Perry, unless you pity me, motto is in a pit. Nay, Motto, treason is a worse pain than toothache. Now, Motto, thou knowest thine ears are at our, our hours to command. Your servants or, or handmaids. Then will I lead my maid by the hand. And he pulls him by the ears. Oh, Dylan, thou winked too hard. Not so hard as he bit me. That seeth, boy, we are both mortal. I enjoy mine ears, but durante placito. Nor thou thy finger, but favente dento. Yea, motto, hast thou Latin? Alas, neither hast thou so many teeth, and never hast Latin, for a tooth is ill brought up. Well, motto, let us have the beard without coven, fraud or delay, at one entire payment, and thou shalt scape a payment. I protest by scissors, brush and comb, Basin, ball, and apron by razor, ear pick, and rubbing clothes, and all the tria sequunta airlies on our secret occupation. For you know it is no blabbing art that you shall have the beard in manner and form following not only the golden beard and every hair, though it be not hair, but a dozen of beards to stuff two dozen of cushions. Then they be big ones. Yeah, they be half a yard broad and a nail three quarters long and a foot thick. So, sir, shall you find them stuffed enough and soft enough. All my mistress lines that she dries her clothes on are made only of mustachio stuff. And if I durst tell the truth, as lusty as I am here, I lie upon a bed of beards. Bought to their bristles, and they that owe them, they are harder than flocks. A fine discourse. Well, Motto, we give thee mercy, but we will not lose the beard. Remember now our inventory, item, we will not let thee go out of our hands till we have the beard in our hands. 
and follow. And they exit. Uh, so it's it's the game of make someone say the thing that's now a crime and uh, and all the sorts of uh, uh, fun high jinks that people get up to. Ha 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 ha! Thoughts from the room about this uh, this little uh, uh, ex- set of exchanges uh, here. Um, I vow by my concealed beard, um, which is a interesting, interesting. Uh, that I, there are two options in my mind for how, what that could mean. Um, there are two, 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 two options. There's, there's the rude one and the less rude one, and I am inclined to go for the rude one. Yeah. Um, but if they're boys, then the rude one doesn't quite work. Uh, anyway, uh, thoughts from the room <laughs> on, on anything other than what I've just been saying. I'm, I'm just vamping till someone waves at me. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> I, I was going to say that because of their, you know, like they're going through like item this, item that and all that stuff. It, 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 it sounds like when, um, what do you call it? Um, uh, what's it called? Um, when someone's uh, belongings are being confiscated after, after being arrested. But he hasn't been arrested yet. They're just, but they're also like making fun of that because it's not actual items. It's more like you know, I owe him a pate, uh, on, uh, you know, like boxing him on the head or something or or whatever it was. Um, and it just keeps going and going and going until motto appears finally. It just it, yeah, and then it turns into that scene from Endymion. Hmm. Uh, Helen. Yeah, I mean, uh, item just meant and more and it was how you created a list so you started with imprimis to have item one is impossible so you start with first and then you say and more and more and more but um so item just means that you've got a list Mm -hmm. Mm. uh stephen uh, yeah, uh, on lists, um, et cetera, sometimes is uh, a, an instruction to improvise to the actor. And we do have a kind of, we do have this sort of uh, armorial thing, don't we? So it might it might possibly be a bit of room there for somebody to start making up ridiculous uh, armorial words as they as they run out of their actual knowledge. Mm. And and also there's a question of how how far is the room going to to uh, you know if the, if 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 this is getting a laugh uh, then you keep going, um, whereas if you have a set amount of dialogue you can't. So it's uh, it's that uh, that uh, yes a nice open invitation there. Other thoughts? We only have one scene left. A leaky. I was thinking about the relationship between the boys and Motto, where Motto is a grown man, but of a relatively humble class and they're really lording it over him in this with the oh are you using fancy words now like us courtiers and you've learned latin have you and uh, just kind of the the status of adulthood and childhood on the one hand and uh, relative um aristocracy or whatever on the other hmm yeah like that um uh spriny I just like the the addition of Pippinetta in terms of the the dynamic going on because it is quite often two male servants just pow 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 back and forth in these sorts of things and it's nice that there's actually a female who isn't she she is kind of on their level with it and she's joking around just as much as they are I like that Yes, there isn't nearly enough Pippinetta in this, actually. She's a nice force multiplier for the scenes that she's in. Uh, and her song's fab. I, I really like her her, her song. It's, it's very nicely uh, nicely put together. Um, OK, so we're, we're, we're a hop, skip and a jump to the end. Uh, so shall we, shall we do a hop, skip? This is our last Lily scene. I mean, not just of this play, but this is it. We're, 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 we're out of Lily for our first looks. Um, so, Act 5, Scene 3, it's the end of an era. Uh, enter Midas, uh, Sophorina, uh, Sophronia, rather, Melocrites, Martius, and there's some others. They've probably got some offerings for Apollo, etc., etc. This is Delphos, sacred Apollo, whose oracles be all divine, though doubtful, 
answer poor Midas and pity him? I marvel there is no answer. Fond Midas, how canst thou ask pity of him who thou hast so much abused? Or why dost thou abuse the world, both to seem ignorant in not acknowledging an offense and impudent so openly to crave pardon? Apollo will not answer, but Midas must not cease. Apollo, a divine Apollo, Midas hath ass's ears. Yet let pity sink into thine ears and tell when he shall be free from this shame or what may mitigate his sin. Well, Apollo is tuning his pipes or a barley break with Daphne or a saying on some shepherd's coat or taking measure of a serpent's skin. Now, were I Midas, I would rather cut these ears off close from my head than stand whimpering before such a blind god. Thou art barbarous, not valiant. Gods must be entreated, not commanded. Thou wouldst quench fire with a sword and add to my shame, which is more than any prince can endure, thy rudeness, which is more than any sensible creature would follow. Divine Apollo, what shall become of Midas? Accept this loot, these berries, these simples, these tapers. Apollos, take any delight in music, in Daphne, in physic, in eternity. When Pan Apollo in music shall exceed, Midas of Phrygia shall lose his ass's ears. Pan did Apollo in music far excel, therefore King Midas weareth ass's ears. Unless he shrink his stretching hand from Lesbos, his ears in length at length shall reach to Delphos. Mm. <clears throat> um, it were good to expound these oracles that the learned men in Phrygia were assembled. Otherwise, the remedy will be as impossible to be had as the cause to be sifted. I foresaw some old sort which should be doubtful. Well, who would gab to such gods? They must be honoured if they speak without sense. And the oracle wondered at as though it were above sense. No more, Martius. I am the learnedest in Phrygia to interpret these oracles, and though my shame hath hitherto caused me to conceal it, now I must unfold it by necessity. Thus destiny bringeth me not only to be a cause of all my shame, but reporter. Thou, Sophronia, and you, my lords, hearken. When I had bathed myself in Pactolus and saw my wish to float in the waves, I wished the waves to overflow my body. So melancholy my fortune made me, so mad my folly. Yet by hunting, I thought to ease my heart. And coming at last to the hill at Timolus, I perceived Apollo and Pan contending for excellency in music among the nymphs. They required also my judgment. I, whom the loss of gold made discontent and the possessing desperate, either dulled with the humor of my weak brain or deceived by thickness of my deaf ears, preferred the harsh noise of Pan's pipe before the sweet stroke of Apollo's lute, which caused Phoebus to injustice, as I now confess, and then as I saw in anger, to set these ears upon my head that have wrung so many tears from my eyes for stretching my hands to Lesbos. <coughs> I find that all the gods have spurned my practices and those islands scorned them. My pride, the gods disdain, my policy, men, because usurping. My usurping without end, because my ambition above measure. I will, therefore, yield myself to Bacchus and acknowledge my wish to be vanity. To Apollo, and confess my judgment to be foolish. To Mars, <coughs> and say my wars are unjust. <coughs> to Diana, and tell my affection hath been unnatural. And I doubt not what a God hath done to make me know myself. All the gods will help to undo that I may come unto myself. Is it possible that Midas should be so overshot in judgment? Unhappy Midas, whose wits melt with his gold and whose gold is consumed with his wits. 
What talk is Sophronia to herself? Nothing, but that since Midas hath confessed his fault to us, he also acknowledge it to Apollo. I will, Sophronia. Sacred Apollo, things past cannot be recalled, repented they may be. Behold Midas, not only submitting himself to punishment, but confessing his peevishness, being glad for shame to call that peevishness, which was folly. Whatsoever Apollo shall command, Midas will execute. Then attend, Midas. I accept thy submission and sacrifice, so as yearly at this temple thou offer sacrifice in submission. With all, take Apollo's counsel, which if thou scorn, I shall find thy destiny. I will not speak in riddles, all shall be plain, because thou art dull, but all certain if thou be obstinate. Weigh not in one balance gold and justice. With one hand, wage not war and peace. Let thy head be glad of one crown, and take care to keep one friend. The friend that thou wouldst make thy foe, the kingdom thou wouldst make the world, the hand that thou dost arm with force. The gold that thou dost think a god shall conquer, fall, shrink short, be common, with force, with pride, with fear, with traffic. If this thou like, shake off an ass's ears. If not, forever shake an ass's ears. Apollo will not reply. It may be, Sophronia that neither you nor any else understand Apollo because none you have, none of you have the heart of a king. But my thoughts expound my fortune and my fortunes hang upon my thoughts. That great Apollo that joined to my head ass's ears hath put in my heart a lion's mind. I see that by obscure shadows, which you cannot discern in fresh colors. Apollo in the depth of his dark answer is to me the glistering of a bright sun. I perceive, and yet not too late, that Lesbos will not be touched by gold. By force it cannot. That the gods have pitched it out of the world as not to be controlled by any in the world. Though my hand be gold, it must not think to span over the main ocean. Though my soldiers be valiant, I must not therefore think my quarrel just. There is no way to nail the crown of Phrygia fast to my daughter's head, but in letting the crown of others sit quiet on theirs. Midas. How darest thou reply seeing me resolve? Thy counsel has spilt more blood than all my soldiers' lances. Let none be so hardy as to look cross, to look cross me. Sacred Apollo, if sacrifice yearly at thy temple and submission hourly in my own court, if fulfilling thy counsel and correcting my counselors, shall shake off these asses' ears, I hear before thee vow to shake off all envies abroad and, and at home all tyrannic. Uh, all, all tyranny, I apologize there. Oh, oh. Um, the ears at this uh, fall off. Apollo be honored, Midas is restored. Fortunate Midas, that feels thy head lightened of dull ears and thy heart of deadly sorrows. Come, my lords, let us repair to our palace in which Apollo shall have a stately statue erected. Every month we will solemnize there a feast and hear every year a sacrifice. Phrygia shall be governed by gods, not men lest the gods make beasts of men. So my council of war shall not make conquest in their own conceits, nor my counselors in peace make me poor to enrich themselves. So blessed be Apollo, quiet be Lesbos, happy be Midas, and to begin this solemnity let us sing to Apollo, for so much as music, nothing can content Apollo. Sing to Apollo, god of day, whose golden beams with morning play, and make her eyes so brightly shine, Aurora's face is called divine. Sing to Phoebus and that throne of diamonds which he sits upon. Iopeans, let us sing to physics and 
to Posey's king. Crown all his altars with bright fire, laurels bind about his lyre, a Daphnean coronet for his head, the muses dance about his bed, when on his ravishing lute he plays, strew his temple round with bays. Iopeans, let us sing to the glittering Delian king. And they exit uh, on a song. They're all singing that song, uh, but uh, everyone singing on Zoom is, is always a disaster. Uh, so, yeah, Midas, um, they're approaching uh, Sacred Apollo with the offerings. I quite like the way the, uh, he has to admonish people with, you know, let's, let's, let's not, not tee off the god before we, uh, we, we do this. Uh, and then it's confession time. It's it's abasing himself. You know, he has to admit to everyone what he did to end up where he is. And then, of course, he has to acknowledge it to Apollo. So there's, there's the point that's been made uh, a few times uh, this session by others is, uh, that, you know, he's not admitting what he's done. Uh, and it's only by doing that that uh, that uh, Midas gets rid of the ears, as well as, you know, don't don't attack uh, other places. Don't 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 do the martial attacky thing. And don't be don't be ty tyrannical. Uh, don't don't do don't do that tyranny thing. And uh, the ears fall off. Based on a true story. It's <laughs> not based on a true story. Anyway, um, thoughts from the room about this scene. It sort of winds everything up. It does wind everything up with telling us stuff we we were here for. But actually, those uh, and as you look at those speeches on the page and go, oh God. Uh, he's, he's going to tell it. He's telling us what we already know. Uh, but actually, th those speeches actually flew by quite nicely. Actually, I was uh, quite surprised. Uh, I saw Eric. I see Lynn. Eric then Lynn. I, I was just amused by the whole like, um, "Hello, Apollo," and then there's no reply. So he just kind of keeps going. Um, I'm here. Please do something. There. <laughs> it was just really funny and sort of um, really well played and well written. Yeah, you know, it's it's trying. It's always awkward leaving answer phone messages, isn't it, uh, Lynn? I mean, despite the, the the classical setting and the Latin and the Greek puns and all of that, there's something very Christian about this, isn't there? That uh, you have to confess, you have to tell the truth, you have to to, to be re remorseful, you have to debase yourself. The, the the first shall be last, and and all of that. So there. That, that that value system, that kind of way of being in the world where where humility is a virtue, which it does, I don't think it really was in the classical world, uh, it, it permeating this, at least this scene. Uh, Lois then Aliki. Uh, muted at present, Lois. And now invisible. Uh, I think that was that was all the right. Uh, go to Aliki while we wait for Lois to return. Yeah. So I mean, being humble before the gods is pretty pretty good classical. Um, <clears throat> what do you call it? Ethics. And going very particularly going to the temple of Apollo to be washed clean of a scene of a sin is is spot on um, classical ethics. Um, Apollo. Apollo could forgive you for murdering somebody, but you had to go there in person and you had to wash in the, the Castalian Spring, which is near the Oracle at Delphi, uh, because it was a literal pollution. If you had murdered, if you had shed somebody's blood, you were polluted by it. Anyway, I'm just going to digress on that while we see if Lois is coming back. Yes, <laughs> Lo Lois, uh, I, th you, I think oh, yeah. you switched off your video rather than switching on your oh, audio. So I did. No, I switched on the audio, but uh, sorry about the Yes, I was poking at everything in sight. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yes, we're not in sight. Um, yeah, it's, I think partly the scene explains, I suppose, the sort of the notion of divine intervention saving them from another armada, which is mm. presumably what, what the, this is partly about. Um, I also noticed that the end of Apollo's speech goes into blank verse, which is kind of surprising. I mean, it's not written as blank verse, but it is blank verse. 
Uh, yes, no, that's a formatting error. It should have been written in. Uh, oh, it should have been, oh, been right. written in blank, uh, blank verse. Oh. We just accidentally posed it because oh, okay. um, everything else is in prose. Uh, it's got some lovely lines in there. Uh, mm. I do like if thou uh, if this thou like shake off an ass, uh, ass's ears. If not forever, shake <laughs> ass's ears. Uh, I, th I think that's um, that's really nice. It goes really nicely with the oracle itself. Um, uh, unless you shrink his stretching hand from Lesbos, his ears in length at length shall reach to Delphos. Uh, <laughs> you know, I just. It's just yeah. this idea that his ears are actually, they're still growing. Um, yeah. It's not that they're just asses ears. They're getting longer and longer. Um, There's another thing, which is just that, uh, you know, they're told that whoever can solve this problem can marry Sophronia. Um, I, as far as I can see, Apollo and Midas have worked it out between them. And that particular bit of the plot is just left dangling, isn't it? Hmm. Uh, yeah, it, it's, it's just something that's said in passing. Uh, and doesn't seem to have been uh, something that probably even was even thought of as being a thing. Um, it's just... Well, it, isn't. it is a thing because one of the comic characters thinks he's going to have a chance mm. and that, that doesn't get developed at all. And actually yeah. there is a version of this in which she gets turned into gold, you know, and that's what really uh, horrifies Midas and makes him decide to snap out of the, the turning thing to gold bit. Mm. Yes, and also the the element of the uh, the reeds that we have here in in the version of the story I know he you know he, he the only person who knows is his barber, uh, and he can't keep the secret in, so he goes down and he digs a little hole and whispers in <laughs> that he's got ass's ears and a flower grows and that <laughs> speaks uh, the secret, um, so that's sort of been morphed here into something that's uh, doing some slightly different business to try and. Uh, semi-integrate the comedy uh, servant characters and the barber into into uh, some other shtick. Um, Helen? The, um, the reward of valour or saving the kingdom or saving the king as having the hand of the princess, um, especially as Midas doesn't appear to have a male heir, is, is, is very uh, medieval, very traditional non-Greek. Mm. Um, but it, as you say, it doesn't actually amount to anything here. Yes, but it is the standard reward. Uh, Lynn? I suppose with Perseus and Andromeda, she, you are, you do get that too. Uh, uh, Lynn, then Aliki. I, I, I was wondering a couple of scenes ago if the gag is that the reward for interpreting what's going on with the reeds is Sophronia's hand, or at least a dukedom, um, and the punishment for saying King Midas has ass's ears is losing your own, and those are the same thing. It's like the reeds are are talking because Midas has ass's ears, but if you say Midas has ass's ears, you get your ears cut off. So I mean, I think there, there maybe there's a gag there. <clears throat> mm. Yes, because what's what? Uh, yeah, because it's it's the what's the why are the reeds talking? Is actually is is actually what he was talking about earlier, and it's, nobody solved that problem. I think you know we just have reeds that talk, um, because this is uh, the uh, I think Stephen coined this the other day, the lily verse, uh, and that's 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 the stick you get here, Aliki. Uh, yeah, there was that moment the last time Midas mentioned that the the reward for the the reed discovery was his daughter's hand where he stopped and said, or, you know, not, you can just have half the kingdom or whatever it was, the dukedom. So there's a nice little potential gag there where Sophronia steps on his foot or glares at him or otherwise stops him that can be repeated here, a sort of a, and uh, so of course he doesn't mention it again. Yes, does Midas gain wisdom by the end? You know, there's a moment where it's a bit like he's gained wisdom and then he's sort of towards the end. It's sort of like, actually, has he really, um, you know, has he learnt? Does Midas ever learn? Um, he asks, uh, not necessarily expecting an answer. Um, so we're into extra time. Uh, and we, we managed to finish the play. We've managed to finish all of Lily. Uh, we can now look a little more into the question of what we might do with this play uh, on a staging terms. Structurally, it's very good. Uh, it, there's a nice place to put an interval uh, or potential places to put an interval. Um, it's a game of two halves, uh, two very uh, separate stories. You could almost uh, make that more explicit in staging. 
Uh, it's not too long. There are some bits you might want to trim back. There's some areas of Latin where you go, well, that might be a bit too dense. Uh, maybe make a few minor adjustments there. Uh, maybe some of the uh, comic business is too much. Maybe trim a little bit of that back. And you've still got a really good a really good um, uh, show. And yeah, I'm, I'm, it's charmed me so far. There's nothing particularly problematic about it. There are the odd moments, we, you know, but that's the character world. That's not uh, the, what the play is necessarily doing. Um, so I, 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 I'm putting this very much in a tick uh of um of of yeah i i, I had fun i had fun there's uh, i think a lot more gags to be got out of the funny bits and more um uh, emotion and uh, uh and pathos to be got out of the uh the the serious stuff uh so final thoughts from around the room i'll go to emma first i think i went to you last last time so i'll go to you first this time um not too much to say uh, similar to yesterday really i think that if you're willing to put in the work with the big speeches and the comedy, the clever jokes, um, then it works really, really well. Yeah, maybe trim a little bit of the Latin. That really tripped me up today, trying to pronounce all of that. Um, but yeah, I guess the other thing to say is that the more we read, the more this kind of allegory appeared uh, of this idea of um, it being about Spain and England. And I was thinking, how can you kind of modernise that? Um, I, I don't have anything particular come to mind just yet, but maybe the theme of money and greed, I mean, that's still very prevalent today. The fact that so much of the world's wealth and possessions and land are hoarded by so few people, and maybe it, we could try and bring in some of that, perhaps, with this play. It's the kind of thing you want to ask the audience as they arrive. If you, if Bacchus was giving you a wish, what would you wish for? You know, it's it, we, we. I think you know everybody's uh, played this game, um, and it, it. You know that's what's quite nicely playful about the opening of the play, and uh, and that sort of that initial gold element. And there's room for some additional dumb shows as well. I'd quite like to see Midas going into the stream, and streams have got you know whether something interesting can be done staging in terms of that and the the visual dimension. Uh, Stephen, any final thoughts from you? Um, no, I, I kind of got fixated on, on the Spanish thing that Emma's been talking about. And for, for me, that really feels kind of um, shoehorned in. In, in said, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Apollo doesn't say anything about any of that when he, <laughs> you know, Apollo just goes, uh, you made a bad choice, mister, you know, and that's it. That is, you know, he's been disrespecting him. And then, you know, people completely ignore that and go, I bet it's because gold lesbos so um, th i don't know that that didn't quite work for me um but the, the thing i did um find out on wikipedia which i vaguely knew about was that the, there was a counter armada in 89 um uh, one of the aims of the counter armada was to seize the spanish treasure fleet uh, which would be full of kind of golden stuff wouldn't it and uh wiggins says that the first performance of this is on 12th night of the Christmas of 1590. I don't know why he says that. So it, it could be a very, very topical sort of updating in the, you know, in the in the period between the Armada and, um, you know, a, a sort of 15, 18 months later. And that might be the reason. It might it might be a retrofit of another play, but that would leave it very, very short, um, unless you imagine there's some better material that they chucked out for all the gold material. I don't know. I know it's, it kind of feels. Lily, Lily's plots to me seem really they they're so airtight so much of the time, and this just feels like you know it's just thrown a rod or something. It's just this great clunking thing now. You know, it's had a flat, um, and that that seems really strange. And I'm trying to link that to the, my excuse as the sort of contemporary illusion. Well, uh, I've re re returning us to the prologue, if we present a mingle mangle, our fault is to be excused. So that's fine. Uh, look, that's, uh, there's a bit of hand wavy in there from uh, Lily in the prologue. You get the impression that Lily knew that structurally this wasn't air airtight. This uh, is not cobbled together. <laughs> yeah, this it, 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 it is cobbled together, but we don't care. And that's fine because the rest of the world is cobbled together. You can't expect art to be perfect, surely. Um... It's uh, yeah, it's it's it. We we hand wave uh, the problem away by mentioning it in passing. Um, he's done that a few times, and he hasn't always got away with it. Uh, I think he has got away with it just about here. Um, Alan, any final thoughts? I must admit, I find Lily rather too formulaic for my 
taste because what you get is these comedy routines, which I suspect almost had a separate existence. And then he cobbles together some sort of A plot to try and provide enough linking material to make them cohere as a show. Um, and I mean, we've referenced the fact of the, the an awful lot of the Latin in gags, which possibly meant something to the boys who were performing it, maybe meant something to some of the audience, but probably by no means all of them, and which means three eighths of Italy squat to a modern audience. Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, Eric, uh, final thoughts. Well, I, yeah, I was thinking about the sort of hand waving that you were talking about earlier. It just feels like that beginning of the man in the moon where he just kind of goes, yeah, well, this plot isn't going to make sense. So I'm not going to try and explain it for you. <laughs> and, um, and he just kind of goes um, on with the show. Uh, but I, I think it works in terms of like, if you know the story or even if you don't know the story, uh, it kind of works in some ways I, I i don't know i was only here for the second half though i did watch the first half um it has some good good shenanigans um in it which mm. can be detached completely yeah i i i, I think yeah there, there, there's there is work to be done to make this really fly as as an evening but i think all all, all the material there's enough material there to to really to really go with Yes, he really does do it. You get you get it in so many prologues and epilogues. It just is. Uh, I th I think a lot of these are written at great speed. Um, that's my suspicion of some of these. Um, that sometimes they run away from him. But that's me just speculating on complete no evidence at all. Bryony, final thoughts. Um, yeah, personally, it's probably of the three. This is the third Lily I've read now probably my least favorite of the three um although it's the only one that, that doesn't have anything particularly problematic that you need to sort out i don't think that's connected i think it's more just that it's it's quite straightforward um compared to the others of his that we've read uh, but that's not to say i didn't enjoy it because i did there's a lot to like here um but yeah i i agree with a lot of the the comments that have gone before the the latin at this point now i'm i'm kind of a little bit over it how he how he does because it, it can be distracting and like you say it's lost the the meaning that it used to have um or the the understanding that most people have of it um but yeah not not bad not bad i liked it yeah three stars from the guardian there and um <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think that's absolutely uh, fine. Uh, fine in in terms of uh, not all plays have to be, you know. Oh my God, I loved it. Uh, you know, I I think we could make a very very good production out of this play. Uh, I I think that's the thing. Is what's the uh, we're, we're, what we're hunting for here is the best face for any produ uh, any play. Um, and you know, we have to acknowledge that. Yeah, there are bits where we're going. Yeah, that that bit's tough to get across to today. Um, uh, Aliki. Just very quickly to pick up on that, that's true of a heck of a lot of plays. Mm. Uh, we do, we, English speaking theatre culture, performs a lot of plays that have some deeply problematic ideas and scenes and so on. And I think just because it's, it's in our gift, at least theoretically, <laughs> to perform these or not, we shouldn't necessarily feel that it's our job to judge which one is a bad play that has bad things in it. Not that that's what anybody said, but anyway, just kind of going off on that tangent. Anyway, uh, I enjoyed it a lot. I think we could have a lot of fun with what, um, what Emma was talking about, about using the gold stuff to attack contemporary ideas about profit. And I think the ears business can go with it as well, because if the goal is about knowing the price of everything, then the ears bit is knowing the value of nothing, not being able to tell great art from shrieking, from commercial garbage, if you like. Nice. <laughs> not that that's what the play is saying, but that's what we could use the play to say. Perhaps. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, Lois, final thoughts? Um, yeah, uh, 
Yes, I, I feel a bit the same as Bryony about it in that I think it's quite a good play, but it doesn't interest me as much as some of the other Lily plays. And that may well be because it's not as problematic. You know, there, there's not as much, in fact, to, to sort of think about. Um, uh, I sort of think, you know, going along with what Emma started, that uh, uh, one could, in fact, make this play much cleaner just by getting rid of all the references to Spain and England, which I think could be cut out pretty simply. Uh, then it would simply be about somebody, um, the obsession with wealth and how it turns out not to uh, to bring happiness. And then the, the sort of parallel plot of these, uh, the comic characters trying to get the golden beard back from each other by some rather nasty means. I don't know, somehow I think that could be played to um, to relate more to this, the same kind of sense at the end of, so what have you got, you know, nothing. Uh, but I'm not sure that that would work because they they feel quite happy with what they've got, in fact, and uh, uh, and maybe even uh, the fact that nothing does come of the offer of, of a dukedom and the uh, and and the king's daughter. Maybe if all of that were sort of left at the end as well, no, we're not getting any of that. But at least Midas is a bit wiser, uh, and and the, because actually the the whole uh, the whole financial crisis and the obsession with money and so on has not exactly gone away. I mean, it's still there. So uh, I think it could be, it could end up like most of Lily's plays, in fact, with the sense of uh, uh, inconclusiveness and perhaps a bit of dissatisfaction. Oh, I, I quite like the idea of uh, trimming it back and making it almost uh, uh, a baby's first Lily. Uh, you know, it's, it's you want to get a sense of what Lily's like on a, on a slightly uh, 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 softer, softer focus uh, as... Uh, uh, the issue there's less at stake, and there's uh, and you can just uh, d dive in. I, it's, it's really interesting that subplot on uh, all the uh, the servant material. Um, it's it's it is that that sense that it is dealing with the same sort of themes, but there is a big problem with that barber's plot because they never really explain as it's starting what this cousining and the beard and the beard mm. stealing is what's actually going on. In terms of its dramaturgy, and Lily sometimes does this, he sets up a situation without telling us what's going on until much later into what's going on. And the complexity of what's going on with this beard and this golden beard that has been uh, cousin and, and what's going on with the barber is, is not really very clearly drawn out. And that's a, one of my, my big structural issues with the subplot there, because there's a lot of good business in it. But actually what is supposed to be going on in the scene is not really clear uh mm. even now actually I, I i think i know what's going on but i don't think i actually mm. know what's going on uh and if we have to explain it in great length now uh then we've probably failed uh lois <laughs> yeah. i'm just picturing a, a little dumb show scene possibly during one of those speeches where someone is talking about what a disaster all this gold stuff has been where you could see midas being shaved by uh, Motto and uh, this big golden beard being taken off. Motto would have to be wearing rubber gloves, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it could be quite a fun scene. And then, and then you could get a whole mime of uh, the, uh, the other guys stealing it and so on. You could sort of make something of that. Mm. Uh, Helen, final thoughts? I think I haven't gone to you yet. No, um, I mean, this is for me, this is the last of the lilies that we've read. Um, I always go around saying, well, Lily, I think is pretty overrated. He's not as good as everybody's making out. But then I come to read them and I really do think Lily is pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a good little play. Uh, Act five, scene two, which is the last of the boys uh, with motto, scenes has an awful lot in it that we didn't get to the bottom of and it needs a tremendous amount of work to work out exactly what is being said and why um and the uh yeah i think that's about it ed uh, following on from what stephen said the um armada of 1588 was only the first armada there were quite a few others uh, and the war went on and on and on. Um, and the results of the 89 voyage were pretty mixed. But nevertheless, I think it's a very, very interesting idea that this, this was referring to 
to um, to Spain and that um, that uh, uh, voyage, the sometimes called the Portugal voyage. Uh, Rachel, final thoughts. Um, no, yeah, I'm in the I'm in the camp of that. This is one of his more you know pleasant plays, like the most pleasant play, but not the one that captures my interest most. Um, uh, and then I'll, I was also going to say about the economics of it, the gold, you know, that he's able to make gold and then afterwards he's starving, you know, it, it, it's a little relevant in that it's, you know, the, in the US, the, there's so much economic talk about inflation and, you know, to all of a sudden bring all this gold into the market, it would be useless. And, you know, Midas probably wasn't the only one starving. Um, and then uh, about Sophronia and, and the marriage not being being reiterated later of her thing, you know, uh, how people were saying maybe she gave him a, a kick, you know, gave Midas a kick not to mention that and, you know, maybe offer a dookie instead um, or a, a, a duke, dukery, what do you call it? Du dukedom, whatever. Uh, we don't have them. Oh, we don't have them. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what I meant about that is um, maybe it's not mentioned in the end anymore because there's that scene before with all her ladies um, where she says, don't talk to me about love. I don't want to hear about it. It's not the only thing that there is. Uh, leave me to my, you know, sewing or embroidery or whatever and dancing and everybody's got their own um, passions. And then lastly, just the the writing style I think of Lily's is he has a very witty writing style and, you know, people have touched on the Latin bit. And I think um, it, he has a highbrow sense of humor. Um, and I think high, high, like sometimes that, that higher educated uh, sense of humor that you need for something like this over time can just deteriorate because what an educated person learns isn't um, uniform over time, it just changes. Um, so I think there's that, you know, the, what Alan was saying about um, that he, he writes in a, in a sort of uh, technical way um, where if you talk more plainly and emotively, sometimes that has a, a little, is able to hold up uh, an understanding for an audience more over time is is what i'm trying to say for that last part i do i, I I'm, I'm just going to roll back a little on the uh the the whole thing about the uh the uh, the the dukedom and the 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 daughter thing i i uh, and asking you know for people to find out why the reeds are creaking I, I i think it's a very throwaway thing i don't think it's ever intended to be a thing um because it's it's there to set up the line that midas Anyone who says that Midas hath lass his ears shall presently lose their own ears, setting up the next comic scene with uh, with the people trying to get people to say things. I, I think we're slightly overplaying this card, and I think uh, it, it, it really doesn't matter uh, in the way that you, you're, you're thinking it will, uh, especially in performance. Uh, Lois. Yeah, but the other thing that is never resolved, I mean, a lot of the first part of the play is Aristus courting Celia, and uh, there's their whole relationship and her unwillingness and so on. And that seems to go along with Sophronia talking about, let's not talk about love. I mean, and uh, the, the, these scenes with the ladies are curiously undeveloped compared to say the ones in uh, Endymion and uh, Saff Sappho and Feo, I think especially. They, uh, you know, they really just seem to be there to kill time. But uh, it is odd that all this stuff about love is kind of there and yet there, there are no romantic resolutions at all at the end. Well, it reminds me of the inverse in Sappho and Feo. You've got this comedy servant material that is also under, you know, then goes nowhere. The servants literally disappear halfway through the place. So there's, there's a similarity there. Uh, that's why I kind of feel that Lily starts with an intention, but he hasn't necessarily fully plotted out where certain things are going and that certain things get lost along the way. Uh, but that's just me projecting. Uh, anyway, Lynn, final thoughts. We're, we're going long today. Uh, yeah, I, since I didn't, I didn't participate yesterday, and I actually have not um, listened to the the recording yet. Uh, my impressions are are different. Um, this doesn't really strike me as being as messy as 
as Lily often is. So, you know, Stephen's comment about it throwing a rod, I mean, that, that wasn't my sense of it because, you know, partly because I guess I, I don't have a sense of the, the two or three parallel plots. So there's, there's actually quite a tidiness that I see. Midas has one problem with everything turning to gold. He does the right thing, solves that problem. Then he screws up again, uh, and he does the right thing and solves that problem. So, I mean, I think this, that, that to me felt kind of satisfying. And I am a little bit intrigued by the, the sort of modern parallels, the problems created by infinite overweening greed and um, the folly of imperialism and, and trying to conquer lands that aren't yours and, and the lessons that Midas, perhaps not really, but we could make him really learn these lessons. So I, I, that, that, in, that intrigues me. I, I, I think that, uh, the, the, this this text does have things to say to us um, more politically than you know the love plots and and the emotions, but um, but I, I really am int intrigued by you know Midas as a, as a figure for political leadership and the lessons that those people need to learn. Lovely. Well, that is it uh, for Midas. That is it for uh, Lily for the moment. We will, I'm sure, come back to uh, Lily for second looks and also uh, putatively in the future for uh, productions. Uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm definitely looking at Midas as a, a, a nice trimmable, uh, condensed version kind of play that uh, that could uh, be, uh, other things could be done with uh, in the future and that makes me always happy but also just as a, a play in its own right, uh, it would make a, quite a nice second and look uh, really to also flow through all the uh, the questions that we've been raising today. All that remains is to thank all the wonderful uh, readers for all their wonderful thoughts uh, today and uh, thank you very much everyone and goodbye. Bye. Midas of Phrygia hath asses ears. <laughs>